before duct tape. There was bartending. Yep, before combining weapons was introduced, the first Dead Rising had the idea of combining food items for powerful mixed drinks. Some have claimed that this was even the inspiration for combo weapons, although I haven't found an interview saying so directly. Regardless, mixed drinks did set the foundation for them, and was a rare example of a Dead Rising 1 feature carried into all the sequels, even the two downloadable titles and the Wii make. So, don't they deserve a spotlight as the franchise staple they truly are? For this tier list, I'll be looking at the mainline game's mixed drinks. The Wii make handles them more like the RE4 mixed herbs, fittingly enough, and neither Case Zero, Case West, nor Off the Record was able to change the rankings for any of the mixed drinks. The two main factors for the ranking are the mixed drink effects and the recipes to make them. I'll also keep in mind how the player can increase the effectiveness of drinks through books or level ups. Finally, mixed drink ranking is based on the performance in its respective game. This should eliminate any bias for any one individual entry, allows me to count for how mixed drinks perform in each game individually, and it means that each game's version of a mixed drink is a separate entry. That's all as far as the tier list rules go, but before beginning, this list was made in part as a fundraiser for a friend of mine. Check out the fundraiser down below for the full story, but a buddy of mine is trying to raise money to hire a lawyer for his war veteran grandfather, who had family members steal from his savings and leave impossible bills to his name. There's a link to the GoFundMe down below, I've thrown some money there myself, and he'd appreciate any help. Okay, now on to the tier list. Randomizer is widely considered the worst drink in any given Dead Rising game, and for good reason. While it heals for 8 blocks of health, the name is misleading. You would think it gives you a random mixed drink effect, and it can, but it usually won't. Instead, it should have been called Upchuck, because it will almost always make you throw up. Now in Dead Rising 3, this is at its least impactful, because you only throw up once and then move on. So why is it at the bottom, and a rare F tier from me no less? Well, first of all, it's because the extra health blocks don't matter. At all. By the time Nick has 8 blocks of health, you'll already have access to both the natural 50% boost to all healing, and the minor health regeneration from the skill tree, so you'll never be able to take advantage of that extra health. Then there's the fact that you're playing Dead Rising 3. You only have 8 inventory slots, and books are completely reworked. So, mixed drinks are your only real on-the-fly tactical options here. If you're saving a slot for Randomizer, that's a slot not going to a mixed drink whose effect you can rely on. Worst of all, however, is that you can't make anything out of Randomizer in Dead Rising 3. A mixed drink mixed with anything will only make Randomizer, on top of there still being certain food combinations creating this dud. So if you're actually using several mixed drinks in Dead Rising 3, you can easily make Randomizer by mistake. Given how quickly mixed drinks are made, it can be easy for a Maxcraft Nick to accidentally turn his Energizer into Randomizer because he combined the chicken with the smoothie instead of the pepper. Dead Rising 1's randomizer is a bit harder to make, and that's what saved it from the F tier. This won't be happening by accident. What puts it to E tier is that getting sick is at its worst in the first Dead Rising. Frank gets stomach aches instead of vomiting, so he's vulnerable for much longer. And it happens a lot more frequently after getting sick. And unlike Dead Rising 2, sickness carries over between areas, so there's no getting around the die roll here. That's another problem randomizer has in every game. Its effects are... Well, random. Let's say you're even lucky enough to get a mixed drink effect in the first place, which itself is a low probability. It might not be an effect you want or can use. Energizer is only useful if you're in immediate danger. Zombaid is only useful if you need zombies to focus on you over other survivors. Quickstep is only useful if you don't have survivors to keep track of. Etc, etc. However, Randomizer does have two niche uses. First, two randomizers make a quick step. If you're in a situation where you can repeat your mistake, you can salvage it into something more useful. Second is Infinity Mode, which I did not record, 
because it requires me surviving long enough to get to Cliff, who drops one after each encounter. Now, as I've stated in previous videos, I don't personally take advantage of the randomizer, but you do spend a lot of time in one place, ideally a safe place, when you're letting your health drain, so the sickness won't be much of an issue if you drink it ASAP, and that extra 8 blocks of health could make a difference depending on which of the books you're carrying. Doesn't make randomizer a good mixed drink, though. Zombie is roughly the same in terms of effectiveness in all three games, and it's not particularly good in any of them, so all three are grouped up here. Zombie increases the player's zombie attraction radius and has zombies prioritize the player over other targets. This is easily at its worst in Dead Rising 2, as zombies already prioritize Chuck if he's nearby. There's not many times where getting surrounded in that game is a benefit. It can help with BB Love's mission, but the firecrackers do the job better. Most sweets put into a blender will make zombie in this game, so steer clear of them when blending. Dead Rising 1 does benefit from zombie more thanks to how easily overwhelmed survivors can get without guns. But unless you're really good at making use of Frank's skills without hurting your survivors, or you just have some untouchable to work with, this strategy usually just makes the game harder instead of easier. It's also one of the harder drinks to make, with only precise recipes involving corn, pie, or milk crafting it. Giving survivors guns and learning to slow down when escorting them will always be more helpful than zombie. The drink is at its best in Dead Rising 3 thanks to the killstreak system. Keeping the zombies coming in can earn a stupid amount of prestige points, especially if you're using a super combo weapon. And since any two meat products will reliably make it, it's not that hard to stock up on it if for some reason this is your method of approach. However, making it harder to get away from the horde should your weapons break and or you start taking too much damage is too big of a downside to ignore. A fairly pointless drink in 2, too niche in the first, and too risky for Dead Rising 3. And in every Dead Rising game, you're better off trying to make something else in any situation. Every problem with randomizer as a mixed drink in the first Dead Rising still applies, but two things make it reach out for D tier. First, sickness doesn't carry between areas in Dead Rising 2, so it's very easy to get rid of sickness in the sequel. This means you can get right next to a door, consume the randomizer, throw up once, and enter a new area good as new. This makes Dead Rising 2 the only entry in the series where you can actually take advantage of the 8 blocks it gives you. But the more important detail is how easy it is to make. Mixing beer with hard liquor will make randomizer. You know, beer and liquor, never sicker. But since two randomizers still make quick step and alcohol is everywhere, randomizer allows you to make quick step from pretty much any blender in the game. And quick step is what me and my friends call quite useful. While I still wouldn't actively make this drink to consume it, its usefulness as an ingredient is enough to escape the bottom tiers. Nectar is a useful drink in the earlier games, if not top tier, but it doesn't complement how Dead Rising 3 plays. The kill radius of a queen wasn't increased to account for the larger map and increased zombie count. Combine this with inventory being at a premium in Dead Rising 3, and the fact that queens don't stack, and the zombies just aren't all that individually useful. However, the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of Dead Rising 3 does account for this, by having queens appear in groups of 3 to 4. So when out in the wild, they can still be of use in killing large groups of zombies, and earn some breathing room. Sadly, Nectar did not get buffed, but instead nerfed. Hard. Not only does it still only give a single queen when that's no longer all that helpful, but it's lost its long-term effects. Nectar no longer draws in queens to the player's location, and it no longer increases the odds of a queen-hosted zombie appearing. So, now only a single pitiful bug is given. Which, in and of itself, usually won't even be enough to help a stranded survivor. 
As a result, Nectar's actual use is the healing value. Since mixed drinks in Dead Rising 3 are based on categories, and most fruit only heals two blocks of health, Nectar is a net positive when it comes to how much health you get out of it. But that's true of most mixed drinks in the game, and there's no shortage of better options with positive effects. While there's nothing detrimental to Nectar, it's not particularly beneficial. A hard D tier. For whatever reason, Capcom Vancouver decided to interpret Spitfire more literally for the follow-ups. For every Dead Rising title after the original, Spitfire allows you to spit literal fire. In Dead Rising 2, it kinda sucks if you're trying to be practical with it. The breath of fire has less range than your punches, there's a noticeable delay between Chuck spitting and the fire actually coming out, and it doesn't do much damage to boost. Chuck can't be grabbed during the spitting animation, so you're at least safe when using it. That with its high rate of fire is its only positive in 2, otherwise a direct downgrade. Come Dead Rising 3, they would instead make it so Nick gets a flamethrower-like move instead, fixing the range issue and even allowing him to hit multiple targets. That slight delay is still there though, and the rate of fire isn't quite as good. And sadly, like with Nectar, it just doesn't complement Dead Rising 3 that well. Nick needs to either keep moving or keep killing to avoid getting surrounded in this game. Spitfire leaves Nick completely immobile if he wants to attack with it, and its damage, while higher than Dead Rising 2's, can still take two full exhales to down a zombie. This is thanks to how fire damage no longer instantly kills zombies in Dead Rising 3, and it will allow them to keep attacking while on fire. Its area of control isn't great either, as convict and football zombies can power through several breaths, and firefighter zombies are just outright immune to elemental damage. The recipes are the saving grace, Dead Rising 2 uses burritos and tacos, while Dead Rising 3 uses booze. So, two low-grade food items can be turned into pretty good heals. While Spitfire overall got it better in Dead Rising 3 than 2, both versions of this drink are just fun mess-around items that are better used as healing items, rather than the improvised weapon Spitfire used to be. Energizer works the same in Dead Rising 2 as it does in the first game. 10 seconds of invincibility. It's just that Dead Rising 2's slower gameplay doesn't complement it in the moment-to-moment -moment traversing. And for boss battles, they often do more of a tug-of-war strategy for the first half of the game, when Energizer would be at its most useful. The book to double mixed drink duration does make it more viable, especially for bosses, but Bosses having larger health bars means that there's fewer moments of abusing invincibility to land a killing blow. Because remember, with Energizer, you still suffer knockback from any attacks. It can be pretty helpful with Seymour because of just how quick that battle goes, but the invincibility is otherwise just a short-lived convenience in this game. Its recipe is also a bit obtuse, as most combinations involve potatoes, apples, and various meats. You can make one from almost any blender though, so it is readily available might come in handy when the mercenaries show up. It's not a bad mixed drink, nothing about it doesn't function properly, but there are far better options in Dead Rising 2 when it comes to a blender. Yeah, Quick Step in the first Dead Rising could be better. It's not useless. An open world game on a time limit will almost always benefit from triple movement speed. But you only get 20 seconds of it, and getting grabbed is a lot easier in the first game. You'll often fall just short of where you want to go when using Quick Step. And since survivors aren't given the speed boost as well, it's only really useful getting to somewhere rather than getting back with survivors. Not helping is how the two best places to make one are the food court and Alfresca Plaza, since milk and wine are the two most common ingredients. Since most survivors are in Wonderland Plaza and North Plaza, the player will be ignoring these two locations for most of the game. In fact, I'd bet most quick steps made by the player 
will come from lucky frozen vegetable spawns in the warehouse, as combining those with the infinite orange juices in Paradise Plaza is just far more convenient. Combine all of this with how you can replace it with the skateboard if you're good at avoiding zombies, and you have a hypothetically great drink that's weak in the knees and shot in the foot. <laughs> Thirty seconds of zombies ignoring you is really useful. So, what is Repulse doing near the bottom of C tier? Uh, simple, it's too difficult to make. Much like Quick Step before it, most of its best ingredients are found in the food court and the Atlantica Casino, two places the player just won't go very often when going for side quests. Now, Dead Rising 2 does do a better job of spacing its missions out from each other, so taking a detour for some Repulse isn't a crazy idea. But on the other hand, I've gone entire playthroughs without making a single glass of it. Gas zombies are also affected by Repulse, and the safe house will start spawning beans when they show up. So it can be of use there, although ironically it means evading the gas zombies long enough to actually make some. Or making it ahead of time, but giving up inventory space for then. However you look at it, it's just not that convenient to make, despite how convenient the effects are. Especially with the double lasting book. Oh well. Third verse, same as the first. But you wouldn't think that's possible. How can a mixed drink be too inconvenient to make in Dead Rising 3 with the on-the-fly crafting? Simple, the recipe. Painkiller is made exclusively with medication, which is only found in convenience stores and gas stations in mass, and it needs more medication, sweets, or booze to be crafted. Worse yet, not every convenience store or gas station carries medication either. So while being able to effectively double your health bar is very useful, outside of the fight against Marion, I never bother making painkiller, especially with how buffed Energizer is in Dead Rising 3. Combine meat with veggies for a mildly useful drink. As the name implies, Nick will regenerate health over time. Unlike the health regeneration from the level up system, regen will work while Nick is in combat, and it can even stack with those perks. Zombies can easily do more damage than regen can passively recover, however, so you can't autopilot with the horde. That being said, regen is a better option for psychopaths than painkiller is, both with how it's much easier to work with and how it keeps you sustained in the battle. And if you get hurt while moving around and start driving a car, the health regeneration will give you a free heal by the time you get where you need to go. Oh, a little bit of an exploit in Dead Rising 3. The game only checks if you have the mixed drink book equipped when you consume the drink. So you can equip it, use a mixed drink, and then equip a different book and still reap the extra time. Yeah, it's busted, but a lot of mixed drinks are too short otherwise to make use of, regen included, so I say go for it. Aw oh yeah, now we're getting to the good ones. If Frank finds two bags of chips, he can turn himself into a walking handgun with a bottomless magazine. Almost literally, Frank's spit gangs the damage of a handgun bullet. It doesn't suffer any damage drop-off, but it is affected heavily by gravity after a certain distance. It's also not affected by Frank's level-ups, so its inability to headshot Cultus for an instant kill will be a bit of a buzzkill. And against nighttime zombies and faster bosses like Sean or Isabella, it won't be nearly as effective. But given how rare guns are in the game, and how useful it is against the slower bosses and normal zombies, Spitfire is far more useful than it has any right to be, and it's a shame that the sequels could never do it justice. Weird to put this mixed drink so high, since at level 50 it becomes useless for Nick. Both the level 50 perk for agility and the quick step effect are the same. Infinite sprinting. 
However, when Nick isn't level 50, Quick Step allows him to quickly maneuver between buildings and alleyways without the aid of a car. While the time limit isn't as important for the standard game mode of Dead Rising 3, what this does to the pacing of the gameplay alone is almost addicting. Plus, there's the optional race against a survivor where Quick Step truly shines, if not borderline essential. While it may not be as important here as it is in other games, it's an easy recipe of mixing two sweets together, making it very easy to incorporate into just about any playthrough or any build. And given how exploration is 95% of Dead Rising 3, being able to run free without waiting for the end game or post game is quite helpful. Oh, you can also give mixed drinks to survivors in Dead Rising 3, and Quick Step actually has a different effect when given to them. It'll max out their movement speed, like it did in the old games. I haven't done extensive testing on mixed drinks with survivors in 3, though, so I don't know if there's any practical application of this. Even the weakest version of Untouchable is still good. Being unable to be grappled means there's less stopping and starting when on the move which in turn means this drink pairs really well with Quick Step. Uh, spoiler alert, that's true for every version of Untouchable, so I won't be repeating that. This isn't as helpful when the gas zombies show up, as they can still vomit attack and their claw swipes can shave Chuck's health off very quickly. But for the majority of the game, mixing together various meats in a blender can keep Chuck going and stop him from getting stopped. And since both Quick Step and Untouchable can be made at the Americana Casino, it's always available when leaving the safe house. This drink got an indirect buff and off the record. Since getting slapped by zombies no longer makes the player drop a heavy item, heavy items in general just become more useful when Frank is grapple proof. If gifts for Katie were still a thing in off the record, it might have earned a separate rating, but they're not. So it's mostly just for sandbox mode assistance. Ten seconds of invincibility. Why is that more helpful in Dead Rising 1 than 2? Simple. Both zombies and psychopaths are more aggressive in the first Dead Rising. So having ten seconds of no damage is going to be something players can take advantage of more often. Plus, the cabbages from the warehouse cardboard boxes makes crafting an energizer before a battle or a dangerous encounter far more convenient. So, players will actually have the option to blend together a massive mistake allowance ahead of time. Sadly, that 10 second limit, even if you increase it up to 20 seconds with the double duration book, makes it far too short-lived of an effect to escape B tier. Dead Rising 3 completely reworked grapples. The damage for zombie bites is cut into two steps. The first is when the grapple actually connects, and the second half is getting bit, with a QTE between the two for more consistent damage and escaping. As a result, the ability to disable common zombies from grappling you effectively takes away their most dangerous means of dealing damage. Okay, that's true for any given Dead Rising game. It's just that with how Dead Rising 3 is set up, being able to avoid zombie grapples is far, far more impactful especially since the grapples are designed to encourage you to get into vehicles whenever possible. And even failed attempts to grapple Nick during normal gameplay can still deal residual damage, so there's an argument to be made that the actual effect is at its most pronounced here. So when Nick is untouchable, he's practically invincible to common zombies, so long as you don't just stand in one place and let them gang up on you. And since the main crafting ingredient is vegetables, they can be made in mass from Elka's food supply after Love Thy Neighbor is finished, if the player happens to be an Ingleton. Its only weakness is that special grapples from the convict zombies and the football zombies can overpower Untouchable. Just be careful around them and you'll be fine. Ah yes, the true Nectar. It has three effects in both games. Instantly summons a queen, queen hosts spawn more often, 
and queens are attracted to the player. The idea of that last effect is that you don't have to devote inventory slots to queens when you have the mixed drink effect. This is more useful during Dead Rising 2 than the first game, since the areas you travel in Fortune City are far larger than the Willamette Parkview Mall, and the queen can actually keep up with you. I'm going to assume you can understand the value of the queen as an item in the series, and the value of finding them more often. So let's go over the individual uses in each game. For Dead Rising 1, it's overtime mode literally requiring 10 queens. So increasing the odds of spawning them makes the worst part of the game go by faster. For Dead Rising 2, Nectar can be combined with the queen to make a secret combo weapon, the Wingman. This allows the queen to sting zombies instead of people, earning 500 prestige points a kill. The player can also have up to five of them follow them at once, allowing for absurd level grinding. You can debate which one should edge out the other here. Queens are more useful in the first Dead Rising, but Nectar is more powerful in Dead Rising 2. But in the broad strokes, both are on par with each other while being well above par. Repulse allows you to ignore zombies entirely, and it can last for minutes on end with a mixed drink build. So, how is trivializing the horde not enough to get into S tier? A couple of smaller details. First is the recipe. Grains are not hard to come by in Dead Rising 3, but without more grains, alcohol, or sweets, you won't be crafting repulse. And grains themselves are not always what you might think. Many restaurants feature meat, fruit, and vegetables, but no grain items. So, you'll be getting the most out of Repulse when you find a supply of military rations. Second, the effect isn't quite as I described it. What it actually does is lower the zombie detection radius of the player. So, any zombies already aggroed onto the player will keep going after them. And at lower levels or with an ill-fit build for mixed drinks, the player can still attract zombies if they stick around one for too long. You can combine Repulse with Undead Solutions to make yourself functionally invisible at any level, but you'll want your use of Repulse to be preemptive, not reactionary. Finally, without any mixed drink buffs, the effect is too short to make use of in any real manner. That's a problem with most Dead Rising 3 mixed drinks, Repulse is just the most tragic waste. But once you learn to work around these three weaknesses, you will trivialize the undead for minutes at a time. It makes it to the top five, but the four above it don't have any of these issues. In Dead Rising 1, Untouchable is the only mixed drink for dealing with zombie aggression so it's going to shine a bit brighter by default. While it's functionally no different than any other version of Untouchable, Dead Rising 1 is just where it's at its most impactful with the tighter zombie density. It's also really easy to make. The infinite pies in Paradise Plaza allow for as many Untouchables as you can carry with you. With how easy it is to stock up on them, and with how naturally avoiding zombies in Dead Rising 1 is just a bit more finicky, especially when escorting survivors, I'm comfortable calling this the best mixed drink in the OG game. There's a few differences between Dead Rising 1 and 2 that make this version of Quick Step top dog. First is the larger map size mixed with slower movement, especially early on, both making triple movement just more valuable. And with the increased zombie count, skateboards are far more risky than they were in the first Dead Rising. Finally, and most importantly, it's the extra 10 seconds Quick Step now gives, as it will now last for 30 seconds of triple speed, which is what I would call the perfect amount of time for a mixed drink effect like this. There's also how easy this drink is to make, though. Milk, coffee, coffee creamer, wine, and ice cream all serve as core ingredients for the speed boost, on top of mixing two randomizers as I brought up before. Overall, Quick Step can be made from any blender in the game. The only weakness is that survivors are not affected by it. This was fixed and off the record, but survivors themselves were broken beyond repair or tolerance, so it's a zero-sum game there. Besides, 
For Dead Rising 2, survivors are pretty competent as long as no looters start attacking them. So unlike the first game, drinking Quick Step and setting a waypoint for the survivors while you go do something else is actually a viable strategy. Another drink from Dead Rising 2 that can be made at every blender, as mixing the two same liquors into a blender, besides wine, will give you a mixed drink that cuts damage taken by 50% for a full minute of gameplay. 60 seconds of what is functionally double health and double healing is ridiculous, to put it frankly. From trivializing the damage of zombie bites, to doubling the health gotten from food, to being able to tank boss fights. It takes what is meant to be a weakness, that most of the accessible healing is booze, that makes you sick, and turns it into an easy mode cheat code. Double health is nice and all, but how about just not taking damage, period? Introducing Energizer from Dead Rising 3. Okay, sure. With this specific version of Energizer, there are still a few things that hurt you. Most notably, fall damage and the QTE grapples from bosses can bypass the god mode. But it no-sells everything else. And by default, it now lasts for about 30 seconds instead of 10. However, with a mixed drink build from Nick, mixed drink effects can last for minutes at a time. This can allow the player to take advantage of several of the game's more powerful drink effects until they can find the ingredients to make a new one. But five minutes of god mode is far and away the most busted, since there's never a bad time for it, and the recipe is made from one of the most common healing items. Beverages. Orange juice, coffee, coffee creamer, milk, soda, water, any non-alcoholic beverage can be combined with another beverage, some booze, or medicine, making painkiller especially redundant, to turn the player's health bar into a decoration. And there we have it. Each section was pretty short, but mixed drinks are largely independent from the rest of the game. I'd wager that's why they're as good as they are across the franchise. When you remove Randomizer and Zombait, which will probably never be particularly good drinks even at their best, the only mixed drinks that dropped the ball was Nectar in Dead Rising 3 and Spitfire in the sequels. And even these could have been fixed. For Dead Rising 3's version of Nectar, give it a timed effect that triples the kill radius of Queens. It would actually help fix the issue Queens have in Dead Rising 3. For Spitfire in Dead Rising 2, Chuck's normal spit is one-to-one -one like Frank's was in the first game. Just have that spit projectile be a tiny fireball, and you're good. For Spitfire in Dead Rising 3, I say make it ironic and give Nick ice breath, simply because freezing zombies is more effective than burning them. And outside of the DLC, there are no combo weapons that can do the job of a better version of the fire extinguisher. It would also allow this mixed drink to work on convict and football zombies. Beyond those bumps, mixed drinks have constantly fulfilled their role as power-ups, something that's not really done in other games like this. They're comparable to the books in that regard, now that I think about it. Oh, in case you're curious, Quick Step is my favorite mixed drink across the franchise. And if I were to add a new mixed drink to a future entry, I'd call it Feel Good. A dark green mixed drink that makes it so the player is immune to sickness, allowing them to consume randomizer, any rotten food, and or as much booze as they want. But thank you for watching, and please consider donating to the fundraiser for a war veteran in need.